Okay, hello everyone. I am Mary Buchinger. I'm president of the New England Poetry Club. Can you hear me? I hope. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> um, and uh, on behalf of the board, I would like to welcome you here today. We do have a really amazing reading ahead of us. And uh, I just want to go over some of the logistics uh, that we have planned for this reading. This online reading, we have to kind of think things through a little differently. So we are planning to unmute after each different prize, not after each reader, but after each prize, so that everyone can clap for all the prize winners for that contest. So be ready to clap and then you'll be muted again. Uh, we will be recording this reading uh, to post on our YouTube channel. And the chat box will be open for comments and feedback to the readers and also to connect with each other. After the reading, for those who'd like to stick around and mingle, um, as you might if you were at a meeting in person, we're planning to put you into smaller breakout rooms to make that possible. So, you know, it's, it's you know, it's optional. But if, you're, if you'd like to do that and just kind of talk with people, you're welcome to do that. We're I think the breakout rooms will help you to actually have some conversations. Um, also, please be sure to mark your calendar for our first new poetry and open mic reading of the fall. Um, that will be on October 18th. It will be online and it will feature Robert Carr, who I noticed is here today, um, Hannah Larrabee, and also David Miller, who's also here today. So, um, so that's October 18th. And now uh, we'll begin today's prize winner's reading with the poems that were selected by Lillian Yvonne Bertram for the Samuel Washington Allen Prize, which is for a long poem or sequence. There are two honorable mentions, Richard Fine and Maura Linehan. Richard is unable to join us today, uh, but please welcome Maura Linehan. Thank you, Mary. Um, thank you to the entire New England Poetry Club officers for organizing this and to Lillian Yvonne for um, naming my poem, Accounting, as an honorable mention. I have um, an explanatory epigraph to go with my poem. Um, it comes from um, my seeing a quilting show at the New England Quilt Museum in Lowell, Massachusetts. The title of the show was Beyond the Border Wall, The Migrant Quilt Project, The Tucson Sector. So you can hear me all? This yeah. is in six sections. 2014-2015 quilt, 137 deaths that year on U.S. sand. Beforehand, all the math she had had to do, what size the squares from jeans they'd been wearing, from fabric she'd bought with Day of the Dead designs, skeletons and shiny white skulls ringed with, oh my God, garish pink flowers, green vines. What size the stitch for her machine to write in red, to fit desconocido five or six times in perfect repetition down pale gray squares, faint stars splashed across, mapping out which square next to which, how many to a row, how many rows, the number growing of unknown, 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 unknown bodies in the desert this side of the border. For this quilt's border, how many tiny squares out of Day of the Dead fabric? Chinese coin pattern, according to the note. Border round an inner one of small denim squares, double bordered, perfectly enclosed. The pluperfect, that more past time. How many not yet dead? 2004. 2005 quilt, 282 deaths on U.S. sand. The next quilt, 
from 10 years earlier. This one, all squares from genes on bodies found in the desert. Ripped genes, genes so worn they're almost white. Genes with black threads woven through. Several three name names written with fabric pens on pieces of jeans, while sand colored vertical strips list unknown, unknown up down their lengths, unknown the bodies, so their families not knowing. This quilter moved apart from the others, wrote she needed to work in silence, no music. She, like the ends along each side of her quilt, Raveling. Two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve quilt, one hundred and seventy nine deaths on U.S. sand. On the other side of the quilt of the exhibit's first quilt, one made in layers. First, Desconocido printed again and again on off white cloth. Likewise, names of the known, but oh, so many more. Desconocidos. Then each cut out a piece of denim hand stitched on top, then just enough denim cut away, as if she were making one of those advent. Mara, are you muted? Sorry. Yeah, we're not hearing her. Good, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay, um, so. Mara, right, you're gonna have to go back a little ways. Okay. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, so I'll start 2011, 2012 quilt, 179 deaths on U.S. sand. On the other side of the exhibit's first quilt, one made in layers. First, Desconocido printed again and again on off-white cloth. Likewise, names of the known, but oh, so many more Desconocidos. Then each cut out a piece of denim hand-stitched on top, then just enough denim cut away as if she were making one of those advent calendars, windows and doors to be opened one day at a time. But she's making a quilt, so she's tacked down the corners of the denim, each square fixed open to the body underneath. Known, unknown, unknown, unknown. She, a quilt she was making, so each square quilted to the backing, along with three outsized handkerchiefs found in the desert hand embroidered in red by mother or grandmother, sister or aunt. Sleep with angels, my love, on one. With you from a distance on another. So much back and forth red stitching for their borders, for this morgue of a quilt, each body bag open. 2005, 2006 quilt, 205 deaths, on U.S. sand. Across the room, a hastily sewn quilt, a hodgepodge of pieces of jeans, bandanas, handkerchiefs, here buttons, there medals of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Sacred Heart, sloppy stitches, threads hanging, pieces not hemmed, not a sharp point anywhere, except names a computer had printed on the cloth along with Desconocido. Every letter sharp, perfect and distinct, black and white as death. 2016-2017 quilt, 145 deaths on U.S. sand. 34 pockets surround a quilted map of a path through a desert. Next to each name, each desconocido, a black cross. A note says there was a dead hummingbird in one pocket. Symbol, it says, of safe passage between the living and the dead. 
a hand-painted one on a white background has been quilted onto the upper right corner. Onto the bottom right, an imprint in faint blue of the Virgin, Our Lady of Guadalupe. 2013-2014 quilt, 122 deaths on U.S. sand. In the middle of the gallery, two very long back-to-back -back wooden pews from a shuttered church, maybe from one here in Lowell, Massachusetts, this city of old mills and new immigrants. I sit facing a quilt made of four squares, four very large squares from store-bought fabric, cut and sewn so a flaming red-orange circle circles out into a hot desert orange, then orange-yellow, then blinding yellow. Superimposed is a large black cruciform design. Four black arms, each with four rays, radiate north, south, east, west from the open circle of its center. Quilted between the arms, white beams with desconocido or names of the known written across. I sit facing a raised monstrance. 2,000 years later, still death to the other, to the one from elsewhere. Across the country, how many not from here, not safe these days? And the exhibit ended with a statistic Humane Borders collected data on 3,002 migrant deaths between October 1999 and July 31st, 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble going from screen to screen. So, um, so Lillian Yvonne Bertram selected Jennifer Freed's poem for the Samuel Washington Allen Prize, which again is a prize for a long poem or sequence. And after Jennifer reads, we will open it up so everyone can applaud and congratulate all the winners of this prize. So please welcome Jennifer Freed. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the New England Poetry Club for hosting this event and all the events you host and for all your work. And um, thank you, of course, to the judge, uh, Lillian Yvonne Bertram. Um, and I also have a long poem. Mine is in 13 parts, but they're short. Each part is pretty short. Um, so this is called Cerebral Hemorrhage. In the room with drawn curtains, my mother wakes enough to ask what's happened to her. But you hurt your head is the farthest her mind can travel. She lets me feed her without wondering why, lets the nurse balance her on a bedpan without acting shy. She laughs when she can't stand up without help, says her legs must have fallen asleep. When the clusters of doctors come making their rounds, she apologizes that there aren't enough chairs. She lifts an upturned palm, gestures. Have you met my husband, my daughters? She lets them ask all their questions, feel her pulse, shine their lights in her eyes, then says she's sorry she can't offer coffee or tea. When they smile their goodbyes, she invites them to visit again. On the phone, her talk floats 
changes course like blown soap bubbles. Then her voice gone. Someone else's laughter comes near, draws hers. She drifts toward whoever is taking her pulse, lifting her spoon. She does not hear me calling into the receiver, trying to say goodbye. I stand in my kitchen, phone to my ear, listening to the room she is in. Don't worry. On discharge, your mother will be given prescriptions for a visiting nurse, PT, OT, speech. They'll come to wherever your family decides to move her. Do you know where you'll move her? Does she have a stair lift at home? A downstairs shower? Will her wheelchair fit through her doorways? Don't cry. Even if her home were suitable, we wouldn't advise impulsive, a blindness to her own, the risk of, given his age and hearing loss, your father couldn't. She tries to sit in sunlight, but it never stays where she left it. Her room feels too dim. She leans to open the blinds, knocks over the bowl of blue marbles. As she reaches to gather them up, her hand knocks them farther away. Week by week, her grasp stronger, the rattling louder, everything she cannot hold, everything she once held with ease. My mother, but not my mother. Her heart, her strength, her wit, and yet what she says when, or what she doesn't seem to, the way her smile, the set of her jaw, the timbre of her voice, so much sorrow. I hold her close. If I can name what I miss, Will I know where to look, how to find it in her? She can't be happy that she now writes tottery words in a sloping scrawl because she can't remember that for weeks she couldn't, only that almost yesterday she could jot names and numbers while on the phone could list her daily to-dos, could paint sunflowers, a porcelain vase, green ripples of ribbon framing an old woman's face. In the hospital, she didn't believe in her stroke in spite of her wheelchair, her bedpan, her idle left hand. Now, three months after the bleed in her brain she quietly seethes. She wants a road back, restitution, someone to curse, someone to kick in the teeth. She tells me she cries in the bathroom each morning, a towel pressed tight to her mouth. In this thin walled place, she can go nowhere to tear out her hair, to pound her fists, to open her lungs and scream. Her days break into individual tasks, into individual portions of tasks. When I visit, she stops partway through her methodical process of getting dressed or washing her hands or sorting the mail to tell me about the order of her movements, the order she's trying to impose on her hours so that she'll get better, so that she'll remember. Though 
she doesn't remember that I know what she's going to say, that she said it already last month, last week, yesterday. She plans and plans to go home. Again and again, her circling words, recurring dreams of return. Nobody wants this battle. So I am the one to take my mother's arm, to walk her again to the border, point out the new barriers, yellow warning signs, how the ground she once knew is now planted with mines. But her mind veers away from belief. She was just there not long ago, washing windows, raking leaves. She is sure if she tries hard enough, she can live as before. Each time I refuse to help her cut through the barbed wire to go just as far as those fir trees, the brown house in their shade, I don't know how her gaze will shift how either of us will bear whatever comes next. Oh, great. Beautiful. Yes, congratulations to the winner of the Samuel Washington Allen Prize. Yes. Um, also makes us work hard. Yes. Mm. Great reading, Jennifer. Great poem. I tried to unmute everyone, but it didn't work. Um, maybe everyone has to unmute themselves for applause time. I think everyone's unmuted pretty much. So we no. can, you can mute some people um, who are not. Mute. And, and it's true. Yes, please do mute yourself. That would be helpful. Um, so that we don't get a lot of background noise. And it's just we just want to hear the person who's talking. So if you notice that you are not muted when you should be, please mute yourself. And if you, um, if we say now it's time to applaud, feel free to unmute yourself and applaud. And um, yeah, we are. We thought very hard. How can we make this feel like a celebration? So we are doing what we can over Zoom. Um, bear with us. You know how this whole online world has been a little awkward, but it's wonderful to see so many of you here, and. Um, really very moving poetry. Grateful to all of you. So, uh, so next um, is the Amy Lowell Prize. And Zvenia Orlowski selected the winning poems for the Amy Lowell Prize. And this prize is for a poem in any style or form. There are two honorable mentions, Barbara Boches and Jennifer Edwards. So please welcome Barna Barbara Boches. Thank you, NAPC. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, New England Poetry Club and Zvinia oh. Orlowski. Oh for the opportunity to read this poem, um, which is about an English language learning class that used to be in Roxbury for domestic abuse survivors um, from the various shelters. And at one point in time, the instructors were requested to assign flower names to the students in order to prevent and any abuser from hacking into our emails and tracking down one of the women. So that's just to explain this title of the story. 
to ESOL instructors for their safety, you will refer to domestic abuse survivors by flower names. Yarrow blushed, oh, oh, in a basement garden of sorts. Fluorescence, heat, dampness, rows of growing things where flowers might linger a few hours to correct lapses in the past or perhaps practice to be in present tense. That class, bright if rather bare, bordered with laminate tables and folding chairs, a baby often slept in a stroller after lurching on subway, bus, bus, sidewalks, ice rutted, down an elevator, creaking bowels to where her mother read, I was in the jar aloud, though her book said yard. As the others, she labored to learn why and remember a plosive sound often followed one liquid and soft. Still that garden burbled with lexical hums and murmurs, an occasional laugh. And that afternoon an instructor paraded a tiered red, white, and blue marble for a break that wasn't just a break, but a celebration. But Leah stood first, salsaed a bit in her snow boots. Bebom belted, oh, say can you see? Then Tulip put her thumb and finger between two lips and blew. The baby howled. The flowers whipped and clapped for the waking and for Yarrow, her citizenship, and our land that one day will blossom again. Yay, 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 yay. Um, yeah, so what we're trying to do is actually wait until we're done with all the readers for the prize <laughs> and then we sorry about that no no worries um so we have three readers for this prize and uh the second uh, on, can you hear me so the second honorable mention is jennifer edwards please welcome jennifer edwards for the amy hi, Lowell everybody. Honorable mention. hi everybody thank you so much for having me i'm so grateful to be here great poem so far um, and thank you to the New England Poetry Club and the judge, Savinia. Hopefully I said that right. Love that name. <laughs> um, so my poem is, I'm trying. I'm trying not to weaponize bitterness, not to poison or overwhelm when knocking down doors, barely creaking open or remaining locked. I'm enabling my tired breath and breasts to rust and ruin the outdated overwrought hinges and are labeled or self-proclaimed or imposed hallways. I'm trying to understand complexity, duality, how a door never swings equally in both directions, why exits outnumber entrances, to arrive unannounced, unapologetic. I'm trying to examine all evidence of affection trust gravity in a mouth mid-kiss. I'm expanding my idea of ownership to my space and bountiful borders, all cells and sinew and carnal sound and silence. I want vastness that motivates. I need my nothingness acknowledged. I'm trying to crease kindness and generosity and listening ears into unforeseen planes that can't get carried by storms. I'm trying to recall weightlessness, to be an unsymmetrical celestial body, a heart beating the world.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Um, and so Zvinia Orlowski selected two winners of the Amy Lowell Prize, Stephen Delbos and Ellen Soro. So we'll have first Stephen Delbos. Please welcome Stephen. Thank you very much. Hi, great to be here. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you to the club. Thank you to Savinia for um, choosing the poem. It's called Poem for Bob Dylan, Allen Ginsberg and the Sea Serpent of Plymouth Bay. Um, and it begins with an epigraph from Henry David Thoreau's journal from the 14th of June in 1857, where he writes, it seems the sea serpent was first seen in the bay between Manomet and Plymouth Beach by a perfectly reliable witness many years ago. One morning he saw this monster with a head somewhat like a horse's raised six feet above the water and his body the size of a cask trailing behind. He was careering over the bay chasing the mackerel which ran ashore in their fright and were washed up and died in great numbers. That's where the poem begins and it also mentions Bob Dylan uh, being in Plymouth in 1976 uh, to kick off the Desire Tour, uh, and the, or, or the Rolling Thunder Review Tour rather, uh, and the album Desire came out of that tour and he was with uh, the great poet Allen Ginsberg in Plymouth at that time. And so this poem is a narrative poem written in the rhyme and meter of the Dylan song uh, Isis, which is on that album Desire. And uh, it's a narrative poem kind of mashing up those two things, Thoreau and Dylan and Ginsburg. So it's poem for Bob Dylan, Allen Ginsberg and the Sea Serpent of Plymouth Bay. Me and Ginsburg saw the Sea Serpent of Plymouth Bay as we stumbled out a watering hole on Water Street, a long black oily beast swimming away while the country's greatest poet helped me stay on my feet. A fellow traveler, Ginsburg, his job on the tour was not as of yet completely defined. When I got in trouble, he kept me from more. He was always my sight when the night made me blind. I'm getting distracted. The point is the beast wrapped itself round the Mayflower's hull. It was 290 feet long at the least with a horse's head, body half python, half whale. And it squeezed on that beautiful ship till the wood was groaning and shaking and boy, we were shocked. We knew that it wasn't safe to stay where we stood, so Ginsburg and me took off toward Plymouth Rock. We climbed up the pillars and got on the roof. The sea serpent started to gargle in fury. And sincerely, I don't want to come off aloof, but from this point on, details get kind of blurry. Ginsburg got talking about this historic old town, pilgrims, Wampanoags, the lobster, the height, of Forefathers Monument. Wait, the renowned Dick Gregory just moved here? This place is all right. The serpent kept squeezing, twas getting obscene. We climbed down the pillars to see what we could do. In Pilgrim Park, I surveyed the scene. We'd come back tomorrow and take pictures too. We got to the state pier and there was the serpent dripping with water and drooling black ooze. By then I was wondering just how much I'd spent at the fisherman's saloon drinking all that cheap juice. No matter, the serpent just gargled and squeezed until we believed the old Mayflower would crack. So I gave it a kick in the gills and said, please man, get out of here. And like, don't ever come back. Then Ginsburg stepped up jingling his finger cymbals and chanted toothy darkness, sick serpent of Moloch. Beast swum from the deepest of misery's riddles, begone by the power of the one Plymouth Rock. The serpent let go, and like a black blob of blubber, blubber melted into the waves as it sank out of sight. And then me and Ginsburg, two cultured landlubbers, walked back to the tour bus to sleep off the fright. So from that night to this one, nobody has seen it. The sea serpent of Plymouth Bay disappeared. I've told you the story and I really mean it. This happened, I lived it. I know it sounds weird. Tell me, who doubts a man who is playing guitar? I travel the country in search of a truth that cannot be bought or caught in a jar. 
these legends that make up America's youth. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Stephen. Wow. Um, and our other winner of the Amy Lowell Prize is Ellen, who was a judge for many, many years and unable to have her poems considered for a prize. So I'm really pleased that she won. So Ellen Soro, please welcome Ellen. It is not, uh, I don't know. Uh, can hear you. We can see you, we can hear you, Ellen. Okay, okay. Um, the judge must have had water on the brain. We've had one poem with so much water, and that's true of what I'm about to read to you. Oh Lord, <clears throat> We are aware of our iniquity and the iniquity of our fathers from Jeremiah. In this breathing dark, we are the world. Wall from birds that flew, detritus of feathers and entrails now yielding no prophecy. Caught cattle floating, bloated, bone emptied, slitherous even, cast from flat and ridge, gone sinew, bone, blood, pulse, without this hold where pitched and planked breath survives what rounds now and towers under an arc, neither my hand steers, nor keel steadies that looked in light of warning not so frail as fear fears when streams river every hollow fountains waters sealing heavens when no prophet in a world of vision but child behind locked doors it is promised will open where beyond rain or salt rush, the moored unflagging tree silvers under the arm of the sky bowed after fury. When tides writhe, exhausted, released birds fly home. <clears throat> when I undoing yoke and cargo of my charge, take flesh born on these waters, take wood promise renews by this ark's death to sow a branching fire into washed air. Then, uh, sorry, um, by this ark's death, to sow a branching fire into washed air, then spanning the removed world, then fingered to endure, will I now, mother, father, root and stem, leaf, branch, soil, holy, I, sinew, bone, blood pulse that quelled winds ashore, past flood, past fire, as seed turns fruit, mud, brick, will stand even as promise quenches here what flares wear in darkness behind my face. I see the dead I am bound to ride out of the erased realm, turning salt 
to seed their blood, my blood, a wine, brine embittered, raising the blotted world in flesh, in dream of forebears whom suddenly not to have is to want their hands to hold when vistas compass the mind's eye, their words to glow gl guides in this seething, who now smear silt under judging waters. Will I then, riven, sick with second birth, when breast greedy the exile death send tendrils tough as vine cords, twining their sloughed scents, still seed time to harvest, these waters spawn. Turn from them in night's comfort cradle or toward. So congratulations to the winners of the Amy Lowell Prize. It's again as Barbara Boches, Jennifer Edwards, and Stephen Dalbos and Ellen Soro. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, Der Hovenessian Prize um, was judged by Maria Luisa Arroyo, and she selected a translation of C.P. Kafafi's poem, The City, from the original Greek into English by Hagap Mergian. And Hagap, unfortunately, is unable to join us today. So, um, so we'll move on to the E.E. E. Cummings Prize. Susan Donnelly, who is here today, which is wonderful, um, selected the winning poems for the E.E. E. Cummings Prize. And this prize is for a poem of no more than 21 lines. Susan Donnelly selected two honorable mentions, Barbara Boches and Alice Kuchemba, and they will read first. So first, please welcome Barbara Boches again. Uh, thank you, NAPC and um, Susan Donnelly for allowing me the opportunity to read my poem called Carolina Silver, Silver Bell. Carolina Silver Bells are trees, if you're not familiar with them, that grow mainly in the south. They're a little bigger than the dogwood and they, their clusters look, uh, their flowers look like clusters of small white bells. Carolina Silver Bell. The first was for my first. The arborist warned me against that rocky ledge, but I wanted the newbie where I could watch it every morning. So it grew, soft white bells the first spring, while the sapling rooted shallowly, its leaves dying off even before she jiggered out of the stroller in her powder blue overalls to bolt. The second, for my second wave from the back, sheltered by fur, settled in humus until we left it one hot summer. Alone, he charged off past pitch pines and beech roses to the razzle dazzle of breakers on jetties. Many mistakes. Yet, look, above, winter creeper and stone, the first has come back, sturdier and nodding its little umbrella of blooms. Thank you so much, Barbara. <clears throat> And uh, our second honorable mention for the E.E. E. Cummings Prize is Alice Kuchemba. So please welcome Alice Kuchemba. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. Can you hear me all right, everybody? Yeah, great. And um, 
so good to see so many old friends and to hear such lovely work this afternoon. Thank you, especially to Hillary for organizing it and the whole New England Poetry Club board and um, especially to Susan Donnelly. Um, this poem um, was written early uh, in the lockdown, so by the middle of March. And the title is the English translation from an Italian opera by Puccini. Um, and I will also read the Italian, probably not well, but at least I'm not singing it. Watch the stars that tremble with love and with hope. All you need, two wooden spoons and a pan. Though some had a violin, a cello, a flute, some had arias in their bones. Others couldn't carry a tune. Every evening, everyone sang from their balconies, even though Italy was dying. Garde le stelle, cha tremolo d'amore e di speranza. Casket after casket lined the aisles of St. Joseph's. The priests blessing, the bells tolling. Everyone with breath sang to ward off the dark. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, Sus and Susan Donnelly selected Monica Raymond's poem for the E.E. E. Cummings Prize. So please welcome Monica Raymond. And after she reads, we will be ready to applaud for all the winners of the E.E. E. Cummings Prize. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it happens. Um, so I'm sorry that we couldn't hear you read the poem, but Hillary will find it and then we will get to hear your work. And the other thing I'd like to remind everyone is these poems will be published on the New England Poetry Club website. So you'll be able to, re hear, you'll be able to read them and uh, spend some time with them as well. So, um, so let's congratulate all the winners of the E.E. E. Cummings Prize. Clap. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, we are now up to the book prize uh, part of our program here. The New England Poetry Club has two book prizes and the winners have been invited to read a short selection from their books. Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reis selected two chapbooks for an honorable mention for the Jean Pedrick Chapbook Prize. The two uh, honorable mentions are um, don The Donkey Elegies by Nicole Brown and Letters from the Interior by Lena Khalif Tufaha. Lena is unable to join us today, but Nicole Brown is here and she will read a selection from her chapbook, The Donkey Elegies. Welcome, Nicole Brown. Thank you, um, and thanks so much to the New England Poetry Club for pulling this together. Um, Hillary, I know how hard that you worked on everyone's behalf, and Mary and Linda, and of course, thanks to the judge for um, his attention to my work. Um, my name is Nicole Brown, and I'm reading today from Asheville, North Carolina, down here um, in the, the south, um, in the Appalachians, and um, it's really nice to be able to read from this little chapbook. Uh, it came out in January um, and I had a chance to read it at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, but then of course the pandemic hit. So this is uh, one of the first times I've really had the opportunity to read from it. So it's, it's, it's very nice, so, so thank you. Um, what you need to know about this chapbook is that it's essentially a, uh, an essay, but it's an essay in poems. It actually started as a uh, 25 couplet hazal that then went and, and morphed into a 25 part poem sequence. And then I started to learn more and more about donkeys. I started to work with them and then it, in, it morphed into a, a 25 part essay. <laughs> so, um, and I've been writing about animals for the past five years and this is um, my second project. So 
Uh, and what I'll do is I just have a number of small sections that, that I'll read to you. So this is from the donkey elegies. Ears like sugar scoops. Ears like hands cupped to cradle a cool drink from the creek. Ears like single petals of dahlias at full bloom, curled firmly upright, but always soft, always open. Furred periscopes, one pivots to the wheezing scream of a squirrel above, and I follow, here as if for the first time that common arboreal cry, neither chirp nor growl, but something in between, like the call of a mother blue jay stoked behind the teeth of an old yard dog. Your other ear, blessed as I am, rotates towards me. Sweet apricots, velvet satellites, the twin soles atop the head of every donkey. On your, sorry, fur the color of fawn grass, long bending done in by the sun, or else fur the carbonated gray of fog so thick it looks like the mountains here are on fire with dawn. Down your neck and from shoulder to shoulder, two dark lines make an X, marks the spot, and some call those ridges eel stripes, and others say the capital F father himself drew that cr crucifix down your back. But I'm not fooled into thinking your liquid blinking and Maybelline lashes make a gentle beast. Like my mama and hers before, donkeys do not stare, but stand their ground. Don't take off running as those gorgeous high-class horses do. In danger, a herd will face inward to huddle around its foals, tightening a circle of go ahead and try me, daring any predator near their fatal chorus, chorus line of kicking legs. Yes, any farmer knows you're more savage guardian than any dog, and I recognize you as one of my own. Fierce matriarch, you'll stomp a hawk near your flock of chickens, chase a bear away from your bleeding sheep, smash the white brains from my coyote who tries its teeth on a weaker donkey. In the Kentucky that made me, long before I was born, coal was the darkness torn from the dark and donkeys the color of cave fish and moonlight hauled the ore cars a history told by a few black and white photos and those few men not yet dead from black lung it meant nothing to me not the black coal or the white donkeys not those worked to the bone workers nor the glow of their tractable brutes those donkeys ghosted deep underground so long they would emerge decades later completely blind angry and young I was ready to kill off any part of me that smacked of those hillbilly roots. And in a basement reeking of cat piss and strawberry wine, we did our best to blow apart speakers with heavy metal cranked loud. We let a blindfold do its work before spinning ourselves round and round, swinging a bat until one of us hit what we were aiming for with a satisfactory thud thrilled to hear all those plastic wrapped candies hit the concrete floor. Little did we know we were acting out our own trashy short sort of morality play. What we were really spilling from the split side of that white pinata from that cheap paper mache donkey. On your back, soldiers more soldiers on your back the weight of victory scraps kit bags of mess tins and bayonets 
canteens and binoculars, cases of lucky strikes, cans of fish flesh and cans of cow flesh, cans of identified flesh gelatinized and named spam. In the first war, you carry picks and shovels used to gash open the earth. You carry the rag scraps of bodies from the fields up to the operating table, then quietly back out of the tent. In those trenches, 80,000 other donkeys and mules recruited alongside horses and dogs and camels fitted with gas masks for photos in that funny, not funny kind of souvenir trauma makes. Just desperate to have a good time. In that ravaged sky, a whole metropolis of pigeons frenzy their way to what they think is home. Tattered little notes rolled and slid into a tube clamped to their legs. And all night in the foxholes, the terrified boys bury their faces in your warm neck, soft talk to you of home, but you are silent. For battle, all vocal cords are cut within the throats of donkeys. The second time the world goes to war, donkeys are airlifted, shoved out of hatches with parachutes strapped to their backs. A, whim a whimsical sight, maybe, all those Balthazars aloft until the panic beasts brace for landing and shatter a drove of knees. Those that hit the ground alive almost look peaceful if you don't know better how quiet they are, how still they lay their weary form over the crumpled origami of their legs. Bewildered and in shock, they look around as quiet as the tethered silk billows down like a shroud. In their expression, a stunned blankness that barely has a chance to ask why before they're answered with one clean shot between the eyes. Breach, cleft, compound, hemorrhage, fracture. The foot soldier knows the killing is the worst kind of mercy, but still he can't help but look up and chuckle. In the air, still alive, another flying donkey. And I'll read just one more section. Ungulate, such a throat stuck word, ugly buried right there in its syllables, just as where I'm from, capable is mostly a word for a woman, ugly as sin, most likely with an ass to be worked off. Can you see me? My once young skin fluorescent lit and name tag pinned to my polyester shirt. Can you see the cashier who stood with me as I bagged the brace she had to wear squeezing up rolls on her back when she reached to scan your chips and cans? Or do you see me years later asking if you want a warm up on that coffee, if I can get you some ketchup to go with that? I went to school, found a way out, but somewhere is another me studying the schedule at the bus stop, clutching her pocketbook to her lap, eyeing the steady river of traffic passing her with just one person in nearly every car. Do we dismiss sturdy, useful beings because we despise what we're afraid will become? Or is it just familiarity that breeds contempt? Foam and blood of the bit, strain of the yoke, clay so damn rain heavy and red, it's bound to snap the legs that sink too deep and still try to walk. Don't say stubborn, don't say thick or slow or capable, bless her heart. Say, thank you. Say, please. Say, I see you. Now slow down, pull over. Look out over that fence and tell me if through the rain you don't recognize standing there 
that beautiful, necessary, weary donkey. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. Uh, so Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reyes, our judge, selected Parturition by Heather Tressler for the Jean Pedrick Chapbook Prize. And Heather will read a brief selection now. So thank you. Uh, please welcome Heather Tressler. Thank you so much for having me and to everyone for being inside on a gorgeous day and um, to Jose for, um, for his selection and for um, really understanding what my book was about in his citation. I'm gonna read um, four poems and given what um, is happening in California and the Pacific Northwest, I've been thinking of course a lot about the rain. So I'm gonna start with a, a poem called Weather um, that is also a feminist love poem of sorts. It takes um, a line from um, a 16th century anonymous poem, uh, The Western Wind. Um, so it borrows a line, a small rain down can rain, and sort of flips the traditional um, 16th century love poem addressed to a female um, to address um, a male partner in a female voice using the anatomy of horses and the anatomy of boats. Um, so weather. A small rain, down can rain, but I am not outside, beside an aluminum mouth of a gushing gutter, watching the city sluiced in the casual event of falling water. Nor am I standing in a shale of rubble, circled by dead children's toys, or crouched in a buckling raft, crusted in cold salt and urine, chattel in a game of rockets and gas. I breathe from two lungs, integral. My legs warm under blankets nightly benediction. And love lies sleeping, unharmed and unarmed beside me, arc of his shoulder, familiar as landscape to a painter whose hands remember the curves of two cleaved hills, forelock of tree line, wild mane of sky. I trace hollow shadows in a dark naming of parts as if my lover were a getaway horse, throat latch, barrel and cannon, pastern, gaskin and hawk. Tender, the names given to boats and beasts of burden, what carries us from port to ocean, trailhead to highway, midnight to morning, censure to pleasure. Fugitives from the dreamt disasters. My beloved of nape, buttock and thigh, or stern winch and turnbuckle, or dock, loin and withers. In your body's boat, I stow trust for safe passage, while distant wars make their incursions, violence sends its newsworthy summons, and weather makes a music of time. A small rain down can rain, and by luck, Christ or zeitgeist, I cradle him in sleep's long sail toward morning. This next poem is called Call, and it's about the extremely rare phenomenon of being born inside of a membrane, um, which is interpreted um, differently in different um, folk traditions as being potentially a sign of um, a young prophet being born of some sort. Um, but since we're all, or nearly all, I think writers or poets um, or lovers of writing and poetry, um, I thought I'd read this poem because it's also about just being an artist in the rough traffic of the world. Call. You are six times more likely to be twice struck by lightning than born with an amniotic sac scarved about your head. 
Child of the veil, the old ones said, their old world membranes broken by necessity in new Canaan. Born in call, she is not holy or haunted, not friend to prophets or ghosts inherited, but stirred by life's bright brashness, its carousel sights that beg for sound. As on an afternoon in late October, the ochre light of famishing gold, a woman carries a harp across her back and turns to face traffic, her profile like a wyeth in an aqueous meadow in Maine. She bears the instrument of her making, walks as if steered by its inaudible weight, what remains hidden in portage, the dearth before melody, the blind birth of song. This next poem is an elegy and it uses a clinical title, um, Anhedonia, which um, means an inability to feel pleasure of any kind. Anhedonia. What now to pair with bread? After you died, I could not think of what to eat. Riddling a logic in every flavor. A revulsion to the idea of taste or savor in the bitter winter after the coroner ratified with sterling knife. You hadn't meant to die. No conclusive evidence of self-harm, his voice procedural, calm. Still, it seemed you made a deliberate gift of the shriven, sunken lake of your bluing body, your mermaid legs that had not moved for 20 years, the steel rods that held your spine upright. Sacrifice higher. When they slid you from table to fire, giving you back to vapor and ash, flame took the hennaed auburn hair where I had always buried my face. Your body, your bread, paired from me, unpaired. And I stood there naked, raw for shelter, each woman's house built on the long bones and breath of another. And I'll conclude um, with the titling poem of the book, Parturition, um, which refers to both uh, midlife choices that women make, but also to um, the Athenian tradition of requiring all citizens to, um, all male citizens that is, to um, or warships into battle. So there's, there's a reference to triremes, which were these, um, ships that had to be rowed of sort. And it's also, I'll say too, a, a Cambridge Somerville poem. After um, many years in grad school, I came back to living in the city and found myself waking up to the sound of um, trains and buses, which I'd become unaccustomed to. Parturition. Low sounds of morning trains to the city woke me with their soft metallic clapping, oars chapped against water. Shock of a steady check and warm apartment. One month in which mothering felt possible. Bearing a child or finding one in need of a mother with or without the adjunctive chaos of a man or a woman, a mate with whom tides of erotic fever, dissipation might occur alongside rituals of care, the shared endeavor of raising a responsible person. The project thought to be natural, 
to a couple or to the business of being a woman. Story I had been told for as long as I knew I was supposed to have a story. Telos of girlhood, its reproducibility, its end marked by another's beginning. Later, I'd recognize that October hunger as bodily response to a pause and want. Steady check, warm apartment, as men seek brothels after battle. My dream of a child, a reaction to surfeit, to harvest and a habitable hovel that promised more than one safe winter. Within weeks, it had vanished, that ghostly infatuation. What they claimed was instinct and part of nature, not a month's seduction, not a shotgun marriage of sprigged hope and release from long exhaustion. I had read a Roman historian who wrote of Athenians made to oar triremes into war across the wide bowl of the Aegean. Their nakedness whipped by a leather sun. The historian noted a phenomenon or had I dreamt it, falling asleep in the riddle of an ablative absolute. Incidents of hoplites reaching port, who, allowed at last to stand, filled with frenzy, strained to leap overboard. Not, surmised the chronicler, in suicidal longing but his wasted arms stirred with hallucinatory flight and salted wounds carved like a runic alphabet across their blistered backs broke freshly open as if the body were trying to sign or to speak in its red ink. And the water they had milled hour after hour no longer seemed a torment, but a mirror in which they could see in another like the self, who they had been and what, having won a war, they had been made to surrender. Thanks so much. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so congratulations again to all the winners of the Jean Tedrick Chapel Prize. Congratulations. And um, Hillary has uh, Monica Raymond's poem and she uh, will be reading it so that we'll be able to hear it. So um, Hillary Salik will be reading Monica Raymond's award-winning poem. So, Hillary? After the fire. I have been down in the cellar after the fire where the sheets of stained glass, bottle green, blue, mottled rose, meant to be cut into petals, Madonna's robes, have been shattered into a kaleidoscope where soot plays the black line of leadings where broken things are at home. Everything you forgot you had is here, melted and crumbling. Your father's LPs, stern and unscratchable, Mozart and Mahler burned now to dervish discs, a potato chip warp volcanic, insouciant and alien, going round and round, a Mobius turntable of time with no exquisite sound. The spirits who live in this cellar are tabloid gods, gods of the quick escape, star transformation, makeover, car crash, phoenix resurrection, alchemist asleep with his head on the rock's egg, mottled marble while metals bubble and slurp 
child of the Bunsen burner. Every minute was like this, but you denied it, denied your explosive song, your cannonball vault from the stars, denied your umbilical flare, that choir of burned mouths, how you, like fire, roared through the house, tore it open, changing everything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I did my best, Monica. Great poem. I'm glad we got to hear it. It's yeah. great. So lastly, uh, the New England Poetry Club board was tasked with selecting a book to be recognized for the Sheila Margaret Moten Book Prize. This was not at all easy, though easily the most fun that we had as a board sitting together this summer, which we did socially distanced to read and discuss the beautiful books that were submitted. The New England Poetry Club board uh, includes Hilary Salick, Linda Haviland Conti, Wendy Drexler, and Jennifer Merkel. And as a board, we selected three books for honorable mentions. And the three books are um, Child Ward of the Commonwealth by Eileen Cleary, Newfoundland by Carol Hobbs, and Boy on a Doorstep by Richard Forrester. So please welcome our first reader of the three honorable mentions, Eileen Cleary, reading from Child Ward of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you so much to the New England Poetry Club board for their tireless efforts at celebrating poetry and for giving me the opportunity to read from this book. Um, Okay, here we go. This book is about my experience as a foster child here in Massachusetts, and I wrote it with every child separated from their family um, in mind. One, what's given and what's taken in each one for one? A name, a home, an address, and whom to address as whom? A family gone, a last name gained, a group of people bonded or not by blood or name. The lowest number, half of two, single, a certain one, a joke, a story, or just one more collective one. I'll show you another one. Most we know have just one child. How many have you one? when the social worker took me. Mom wears a sundress in December, rocks herself to sleep. I watch over myself, teach myself to speak. I say lipstick or pischetti, poke holes in my tights, pull snarls from my hair, toss and catch a puppy on the stairs. I hide in an attic, clamor through the halls, map my slapdash kingdom and crayon on the walls. The neighbors dial phones shut behind their doors. They call me feral, are they scared by the poor? My dog, Sheber snarls, I mother may I on the lawn. Two giants step forward, then fee fi fo, I'm gone. Foster kid. Ask her her name and where she lives. She answers, Burke, Fitzpatrick, Shaughnessy. Old family, new family, wake up, we're home in Rockland, Salem, Braintree. Her brothers, gone or born last week. Mothers, aunties or ma'ams. Leany slurps noodles straight from a pan. Stuffs liverwurst through porch slats, swallows meatloaf, thin sliced and too fast, while the real share dinner in the next room. She's four, seven, or just turned 10, never an only, mostly an extra, always between. In the next town over, it's October again. How 
the goldfish. Howdy dowdy diddle o day. Howdy dowdy diddle o day. Howdy dowdy diddle o day. Oh, lally to do leo. As our visits stretch further apart, I can't see her with my eyes closed. My foster mother says, forget. I do. Look at this picture, though. Four small girls in jumpers dressed for a reunion. Look closer. In this corner, if you squint, you can almost see a strand of her hair. My foster mother tells me, forget. Eileen, to forget. it's hard to hear you. Okay, but not to forget. Is that better? It's a little better. You need to speak up. But not to forget my birth mom passed out across the front threshold, how we kids use only the back. So I forget. Howdy dowdy diddle oh through our days and how she hums herself into a blanket. How after again the ambulance takes her, we play Wizard of Oz follow bricks through Flaxen Park to a Blackbird Tower. How when she's back home, we think we wished her there. How even on bad days, her scoring paragoric, us in the back seat, she troubles to steal us an aquarium. How the goldfish dies and dies and dies. Flight of the White-Throated Sparrow. As tall as a table when my mother told me the dead someday return. I cast earth, fists, dirt full, one to the next I feed the trees. Flap my hands, but do not fly. Any god may assume habits of a white-throated sparrow and need not explain why. I ask maples if they miss the bodies they drop, miss their quietudes. I carry their red deaths entombed in wax paper. After years apart, the state brings my brothers and sisters for a visit. It's almost as if we're alive. On my two-year-old brother gone missing. Not his ride on pony but it's print in the grass. Galloping white space, gathering its fields, knicker whisper, thunder, burn. Once at Angelo's grocery, I reached for a small boy. Niobe at least had a corpse for each. We thought, Perhaps Rhode Island or a border town nearby. But the stars on his face haven't mapped his way back. Turn off the afternoon, then the sky. Child Ward of the Commonwealth. Taken from wrecked corners, we that wreckage. From our parents' arms into the state's hands by the handfuls. Seven years position themselves in the corners of strangers' rooms. A blue door, what some might call sky, the first mother, light, falling on film, gone and not gone. We carry like a dead baby our unfinished love, a thing holy yet dreadful. 
Through awkward centuries of November, shapeless days assemble. And I'm gonna close with a poem called Potatoes, Their Various Moods. Your hand hesitates to reach for potatoes alive on your countertop until you cook them. God bless the tubers who've known all along this life was not their own. Coffins were hard to come by during the famine. We're all foxfire or timber decayed. We are not. What I mean is it's September. Let's see how the weather holds. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. That was terrific. Uh, so Carol Hobbs is our next honorable mention, and she will read a brief selection from Newfoundland. Carol Hobbs, please welcome Carol. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm reading today from um, my book, Newfoundland, but I wanted to first thank the New England Poetry club board uh, and uh, it's just such an honor to be here with all these amazing poets today so congratulations to all. Um, I'll start with the first poem of the book it's called Narwhal. Uh, first of all this book is my uh, book of immigration. Uh, I'm originally from Newfoundland in Canada and uh, moved here to Boston uh, some time ago now but um, always uh, the place we're born remains with us. So uh, I'll begin with Narwhal and uh, this poem is actually uh, about an experience of seeing um, a narwhal which was trapped in uh, the very quick freezing ice in the bay near my home in Springdale, Newfoundland. Narwhal. Hall's Bay is a china plate I skate far out to the breathing hole where the men chop the ice away. The echo of auger and axe grapples the lip of hills. They are building a lung for whales. A pair of humpbacks, a narwhal surfacing through the slush. The little narwhal lingers, mottled backed, steaming, its eye oily in the dark cup. Me mirrored in the eye slick. The horn spiraling in brittle air. Um, the next poem is about uh, my grandfather's sisters who died in the influenza outbreak of 1918. So has some probably connection to what we're all experiencing right now in the pandemic. My great aunts died of influenza in childhood. I have them floating on chairs, sitting upright, side by side, their feet never touching tile, but weighted nonetheless in buttoned shoes. If I fill the hems of their skirts with pennies, if I assign them the blue eyes of my sisters, will I bring them to ground, those almost birds, their clipped feathers? One mouth is a pouting spoon, the other a trumpet blast. I ache to tie up their blonde hair with ribbons, each ringleted parting. I would press this image between black album pages before they slip from me, before gravity shifts. I never knew them. A poem about my mother. Steady Goods. Cabbage pickles with bright mustard and black beads of pepper, considering also the beets. I stand in the pantry while something famous happens outside. My brother has climbed the ladder one story to the roof. His running gait shakes the shelves and jars. He leaps and flies, following the geese south. And in the brief silence, I take out of the bottle a silver rod of herring from its brine. Everyone pities our mother, commends her long suffering and good sense and speed in brushing him off. Stand up, walk. Mothers speak in this biblical way. And in the known world, I am lost among steady goods, the labeled bottles, the preserved moose, seal, 
oily and black as loam, jams and amber and garnet, bake apple, partridge berry, damson, a white rabbit in its perfect cardigan of fur, hanged by the wire snare. And what about my dad? Caribou on a slab of plywood in our garden. My father says they are so pretty, caribou, and they are. I smooth one's head around the muzzle splay of white above the mouth, back toward the soft cheek. The caribou's eyes are open, so I sing to it, hush a don't you cry. I have a pretty voice. My father hums along and cuts away the skin from the severed hind quarter, or rather cuts, then lifts the skin back as if he were helping a woman remove her coat when she's come in from the cold. Exposure. They say when you become cold enough, your body pretends it has slipped into your mother's bed and you are looking anew at the slatted wood ceiling. The curtains wave like exotic finches, bright yellow apparitions you do not fear. They wing through the lilacs of the wallpaper. You bring, you dream of the beginning of things and the race to be four-legged and velvety and the master of every season, the days retreating beyond all saving grace. Your mouth opens without words, a hollow hinge. Your skin forgets it is cold and you are happy again. This next poem is in memory of my brother Morris and his wife Mildred. Squall. In January, late night, my merry brother speeding along the ice shelf, then over, his grasp on the throttle and on the brake followed the machine's glistering shroud down. His wife thrown out, splayed out, cracked clean open to ride the tide to shore. And he released to the undersurface where it was dark and darker still at the bottom where his body came to lie until summer, found frozen in the inlet water, still wearing the helmet and visor, the orange survival suit. Ocean is not substance, but force. I'm left to drag them along like ballast. This is a poem of returning. Walking the headlands at Cape St. Mary's. I don't forget slights and assumptions. Belonging is a given and not a labor of vigor. I've been gone a thousand years, but here I am, singing my family song of sunkers and roars, even laughing some. I am animal on this headland of juniper. I lope out into it, my feet crushing a woodsy citrus smell I could lie down on and sleep. It seems a bad choice. It's very windy, I have no blanket. The fragrance floods the sea cave a mile deep. I could rest, I could pin up my hair with a stray twig. I could find shelter. I've heard dire warnings. A walker on the barrens eats partridge berries, returns home, but it's years later and no one knows her. And my final poem today is the title poem for the book, Newfoundland. The sea is 10,000 thousand bright occurrences. Tides rise up and ice call and reply. History falls away, first light recalled, dimming. This is where to shake off sorrow like dust along a track of hills, risen like a sleeper's hip, dark water slipping. Gannets with their golden crowns lie down, steeped in forgiveness. High tides rise too high, ribs of skiffs jut like cathedrals. It is very late for the earth, Whales squint like shadows, on see what has been seen, the abundant view. There's frost on their lids. They dream of beach plums, the winter beach strewn blue with mussels sucked dry. 
In the beginning, Conception Bay was gold in that soft belly of kelp. There were green rocks smooth and thrown to oval, and squids full of circular scars. Whales slid like the sides of Armageddon that reeked of dying. Whales did not invent this, but here they are, their backs all blade and anarchy, gunnel to gunnel, the body of a world that never sees the sun. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And uh, our last honorable mention is uh, Robert Forrester, who will be reading Boy on a Door from Boy on a Doorstep. So please welcome Richard Forrester. Thank you. You can all hear me well. Yes, good. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And I want to thank the, the board for, for this honor. Um, I, it's really very heartening, more than you know. I have two poems to read. Um, both one is rather long and the other is a little bit longer, but they should go quickly. Uh, the first is, well, first I want to show the book. It's a new and selective, so it gathers um, poems from over 40 years of my writing. And one of the pleasures of putting it together was when I was working on the new poems, I intentionally meant them to be sort of after echoes of earlier poems, so that there are connections, um, images and themes uh, reemerge. So you'll see the, the connections between these two. Uh, this first one, The Traffic Between, is from about 25 years ago. It starts with an epigraph um, from Dante's Inferno, and I won't um, mangle the Italian for you, but uh, the context is Dante notices that the souls of the dam seem to be in a hurry to cross the river to get into Hades. And he wants to ask Virgil, well, why is this? Um, but thinks Virgil will be annoyed if, um, uh, Dante asks any more, more questions, so he keeps his mouth shut. Uh, the traffic between. Like a priest in the shadowed confidence of his confessional, the cabbie eased one shoulder back against the plexiglass divide and urged the question through. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? The man was too sincere for me to laugh out loud. Still, I swallowed hard, trying to ignore the white noise that had been drawling from his radio all along, a Thorazine haze direct from Jesus incorporated. Can't say I have, I almost said, but didn't want to condemn myself to his mercy for 33 blocks of midtown traffic. For a while, his eyes seemed to linger in the rear view, where he'd strung a crucifix on a chain. It swayed erratically, a pendulum jarred from its course over a small gilt frame with snapshots of his wife and child. Beside it, a plastic pair of praying hands glued firm was wreathed at the base with a strand of worry beads. Is there hope, I thought, and turned my head to the motley stir of shop fronts snailing past. Soon, I was lining up my old defensive arguments like flintlock muskets in humid weather. I wanted to tell him that long ago I knelt on green slopes charged with prayers transforming lights, that I believed I could glimpse a face behind the scrim of each leaf I peeled from the tablet of my days on the wall. I wanted to tell him of my sadness at waking finally to the treadle sounds of doctrines being honed into axe heads. How, I, how could I convince him that this is how death first entered the world, through certain faith and obedience? That the words of preachers flow down through history like unappeasable magma? That women can fester on the fullness of life and the souls of children starve even faster than flesh? This is the body of facts that faith must swallow whole. But what of Father Pelletier who tongued me in the sacristy before saying mass? This I would declare and more in one extravagant elegy, in salvos more offensive than evasive. 
and yet when my eyes drifted back to engage the cabbies, I knew he was thinking, but what's all that got to do with Jesus? Is he any less because of the sins of hypocrites? And when at last we approached the destination, he broke the silence matter-of-factly. When the rapture comes, you know, you'll be left in the back seat without a driver. Then where will you be? I summoned words as best I could and wore a mock victorious smile. Right here, I guess, right here, then fumbled with the fare and struggled out. Uh, almost to the minute, uh, two years ago today, my mother died, uh, just shy of her 110th birthday. And um, this poem dates from about a year and a half ago. Uh, and it's in six parts, and it's an elegy of sorts. You'll, you'll see why of, I say of sorts. It's called Long After. One, the news at midnight. Six decades gone, and still the fiery brand survives, the sear fleshed like a scar, though the wounds invisible, worried by habit's mindless fingers, a kind of itch not even neglect can soothe. To say I exist is insufficient. To say I wished her dead amounts to much the same, a void to pour worlds into. Now in the night, my windows draped, the room pitched with broken sleep, comes a bolt igniting a twinge, an ache, a rash burning with superations of remorse. Call it a son's residual affliction, the viral bloom, a pox, this lingering affection. Two, a locked door. Stripped, I'm pink. A nursing pup soon burnished red, an ember bellowed in huffs of fury. Al, don't hurt, she taps at the door. He whispers, boy, if you ever. Al, don't hurt the boy, though he deserves it. Three calloused fingers stroke from below as leather flails across my cheeks. But it's her her whimpers seeping like semen's muffled spillage, salt of the denim sea I drown in, whiskied breath at my ear. Mother, mouse, provocateur, what made you love him so that you'd sacrifice a child on that altar? Three, the D-train. Catechized and streetwise at seven, I already knew a soul could turn boot print black and hard as dust, tamped flat on a sidewalk slab. Dreading my walks from school, I gladly stepped on every crack and line, letting sin engender other rhymes. Watch your back and you'll be fine. Grown secure in the leaky raft of my immortal soul, I set myself adrift one day. I disobeyed and entered the rumbling cave I hoped might lead to brief salvation. The subway became the flickering rapids I thrilled to ride. In 56, no one took note of a boy with 15 cents in his pocket for passage through an underworld that flumed into light. So many possible futures elsewhere. Steamships and ferries on the Hudson heading where? the trafficking millions, the ice rinks etched meanderings like Atlas shouldering his orb. I grew to accept the way to boyhood alone in the rapture of discovery. The turnstile spun till home by dinner time. I resumed my past. Four, the latest inventory. Time ravaged, blind, deaf to the world as she had always been with faculties intact. Never learned to drive or play a sport, held no political conviction. Born under the Kaiser's reign, Mahler still three years from his grave. At 10, fever racked with Spanish influenza, hair gone, then graying. 
crossed in steerage on the Bremen, sat in Manhattan's dark, tutored by talkies, love parade, applause, then married in haste at the crash, the thirties, her forties, post-war in the Bronx, then a boy, a boy like a Dresden doll, a curio to keep close and dusted, never clean enough, white as the tub she scrubbed after sending him for a bath, spick and span for his scuff prints, a hiss of pledge for a smudge, pots washed and dried before dinner, going cold with waiting, always waiting, a click in the lock then rages, Al, don't hurt. The fifties, the sixties, Dragnet and Perry Mason, feet up on the sofa, then countless reruns, waiting for justice to be served. The culprit exposed, the boy banished to bed in clean pajamas, wait till your father gets home. Five, Lazarus come forth. Consider it's all untrue. The memories a grown man resurrects, and that the summoned dead are only ghosts and tatters that never lived except inside the windy cavern of his head. Then why persist to stitch and mend a narrative fraying at the seams and still not make a winter coat to keep from shivering, to keep his breath from turning into ice, or worse, an empty vapor? Six, an obel for the ferryman. Come now, boy, stop wandering these endless tunnels looking to escape. You're old enough to comprehend they flow in only one direction. And that token you clutch in your fist, see how sickly green it's turned with bitter sweat. And yet it holds the cure you seek, a meager fare to send a mother on her way. Now give it here and leave, or else you stay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for that, Richard. So the, uh, the board selected Sarah London's book, Upkeep, for the Sheila Margaret Moten Book Prize. We found that Upkeep surprised us again and again, its freshness of language and perspective on the very old story of loss. And you'll hear for yourself as she reads. Uh, after the reading, we'll have a hearty round of applause for all the winners of the Sheila Margaret Moten Book Prize and for all the winners here, prize winners. Um, and we uh, also remember, we welcome you to stick around if you'd like and mingle for a few minutes in the chat rooms. So now, please welcome Sarah London, reading a brief selection from her book, Upkeep. Thank you, Mary, and hi, everyone. It's been such a treat hearing uh, your terrific poetry this afternoon. And uh, thank you so much to the New England Poetry Club board for this wonderful honor. And thank you to my publisher, Four Way Books, and to my family and friends out there, and all of you who have tuned in to listen. It's delightful to be here. Uh, I'm reading from my book, Upkeep, and uh, like Richard's book, it includes elegy, and uh, many of my poems are focused on my father, who died in 2012. This first poem, I'm reading three poems, and uh, the first poem is called Kiss. All day my father complained of the noise. Today they took it down, that massive elm across the street, unproclaimed family crest, cut down and carted away in a yellow truck. On the lawn below these turret windows, hands in his sweater pockets, he's walking over to inspect the job. Still with his morning moodiness, his gait is unusually stiff, but he bends from the waist like a boy, draws a hand in circles over the fresh cross-section, thinking of the years a hundred easily spent in perfect spangles of wood, rimmed reminders of old nests. And when he stops with the stump behind him for a moment, I worry he'll sit down on it and look ridiculous and old. This morning, 
when he snapped over breakfast, I knew it wasn't only the noise, the gnarling argument of the saw drowning out the birds, the scrape of silver against our plates, but the season's leave takings, the air thinning in the ticking house. Now he looks up, sees me in the turret, waves and heads back over. The longish graying hair he comes straight back, lifted comically by the wind. They're new, these things he takes time for, fills the feeders in the yard, watches the cat. He'll even climb the two flights to watch the sun go down from this empty room. He rarely came up when I lived here, where we slept, my boyfriend and I, teenagers anxiously testing his reticence. But one night, one midnight, he did come up and stood with his back to the jam to tell us too quietly that he had come from frantic hours in a police holding room with a woman, a patient of his, who had driven her daughter out after dinner, shot and killed her behind the synagogue. He lingered a long time in the room, absently scanning my strewn clothes and sheet music, answering our questions, talking slowly about the confusion, the husband, the older children at the house, his patient he couldn't calm, and all because the daughter was returning to Boston where her lover, a Jamaican man, was waiting. And before he went down, his eyes red with exhaustion, he kissed us both, almost absent-mindedly. I hear that rare rhythm of his hard shoes on the stairs, familiar stranger that he is to this room. He won't notice the huge gap in the foliage, the unblinking lake, or beyond, the Adirond Adirondacks rolling dips and rises. He'll pause to catch his breath, ask what he can carry down. This next um, poem has actually two locations in it. Um, one is uh, California, where I lived for a time when I was young, very young, and, uh, and Vermont, where I did most of my growing up called um, True Value, and one of my favorite things to do with my father when I was growing up was to go to the hardware store with him. True Value. I don't know why I loved the tree of nails, with its tin containers holding spiky nests of galvanized or ungalvanized steel, so weirdly medieval, like a rough forged fur. It was always best to let the store clerk pinch the nails with his smudged leather glove, drop them into brown waxy bags promising true value. Here solutions were sold in penny weight. The aisles for a child were stocked to dope the eye. All blinking deliverance from molten unknowns came fires, fixes flickering forward, cast, pooled, screws and bolts, braces, chains, brackets and plates, a map to rugged purpose, or just artful scabs for a world of scrapes. Chair backs detached, wobbly stairs, newel posts split or missing. These were dittos of our own undoings. Even the hickory heart of dad's hammer cracked. Did he just know to bring me here, or did I beg to come along? It took me years to discover the cure-all hinge, the double action kind, so doors could swing, the coiled hinges kept, uh, the coiled hinge spring kept a kicked door waving. Like the one my father, dead, nonetheless goes out and in. Funny how memory's hardware stays greased to keep the ghosts from going. He'd agree it's good to keep practical joinery at hand for when the flaps of a house or box come loose. But I employ this hinge, a Stanley, just one by two inches, for its wit of parallel spines, each spooling stacked pins, so you open an alloyed leaf to the left, close it, then open, voila, to the right. He knew the quirks and limits of clinging. 
and come snow, his time, all but the furs have let go. There are days that depend on such pedestrian repair. And the final poem uh, that I will read is part of a series of poems in this book that address a visiting uh, Martian figure. And I'm ending on this poem. I, I think it um, perhaps reflects a mood that many of us have been in of late. It's called Martian Melancholia. Maybe I have you all wrong, your ethereal equanimity, as if a transparency of blood is the same as a lack of bile or melancholy. We're sculpted with it, as you've probably noticed, our cells hysterical in the body's seas of devotion and doubt, our blood a mulligan stew of self-sedition. Yes, we do find uplift, even in a backyard crow scrabbling beyond the window like Charlie Chaplin and his here there vectoring. We too float on inner wings along currents of clocked assurance. But sometimes the meaning of our very clothes dissolves as we tend to this or that. Our stones of pocketed sorrows could surely sink weightless you. Many here think nurture is the default nimbus of why and because. And some of us carry a limber refusal, a quiet. Maybe you've hidden it in the hem of your coat of light, this pain that tends in rhythmic intervals to bloom its own protean cure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Wow. Congratulations again to all the winners of the Sheila Margaret Moten Book Prize. We can clap. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And again, many, many thanks to our judges. What a difficult thing to do. Um, and again, congratulations to all the winners. We Look forward to seeing you on October 18th, which is our next new poetry and open mic reading, the first one, I guess, of the fall. And I just wanna to say to everyone, really good to see you here in your faces and to just be together in this space. So do take care and um, I hope to see you in a breakout room. <laughs>